Hello and welcome to the next talk in the Eric Northeast and Tees Valley Wildlife Recorders Conference 2020. Today's talk is on invasive non-native species in Northeast England. And we're delighted to have Emily Isles and Joe Tailforth from the Tweed Forum speaking today. The Tweed Forum is a cross-border group of statutory and non-statutory bodies local stakeholders, the private sector and environmental non-governmental organisations all working together for the wider Tweed catchment area. So it's a great example of um, cooperative work to look after the environment. Now, Joe and Emily are both project officers for the Tweed Forum and they've sound like they've got interesting and varied jobs. Their roles include doing things like fundraising, overseeing the contracts um, of the actual control work that's done. They organize the work plan for the project. So they work with volunteers and staff. They collate data and organize the maps. Joe's got a particular focus, geographic information systems projects, GIS stuff. He's involved in the River Till catchment area and he coordinates the invasive non-native species strategy. And they also do things like liaise with farmers and landowners and promote the project in general. And just to get to know them a wee bit better, Emily is a farmer's daughter from Oxfordshire. She's also an ex-international rower and she's got a degree in wildlife conservation and ecology and she's been working for the Tweed Forum since 2015 and loves living in the borders. Jo was brought up in a rural area of the Lake District and that's where his love of the outdoors was ignited and his desire to look after and care for the environment sort of grew. He, his academic background is he's got a degree in Geology and Earth Sciences from Edinburgh University and he's also got an MSc in Geographic Information Systems. So lots of great experience there between the two of them. who has been working for the Tweed Forum since 2018. So I'm really looking forward to this talk and if you've got questions while it's been premiered you can pop them through either in the chat or the comments. We're sort of keeping an eye on both areas and we'll do an M present as this talk goes out for the first time and be able to answer your questions if you've got any there. If subsequent to that, if you've got questions, just get in touch. Have contact details available at the end or in the blurbs so, um, or the comments. So just get in touch if you've got more questions and um, to you. So enjoy the talk. Thanks again for watching. Hello everyone, my name is Emily Isles and I'm the project officer at Tweed Forum and I run the Tweed Invasives project. Together with my colleague Jo, who will speak a bit later, we've put together this talk uh, covering a host of different topics regarding invasive non-native species with a particular focus on freshwater and riverbank species which are found or targeted in some way across the northeast of England. Firstly, a quick bit of background information about where we are. The Tweed catchment is approximately 5,000 square kilometres. It is situated in the northeast of the UK and it is a cross-border catchment, with the majority being in Scotland and some being in England. Our work at Tweed Forum focuses on promoting sustainable use of the Tweed catchment through holistic and integrated management and planning. We are a member of the Rivers Trust movement and much of our work is connected to watercourses in the tree catchment. In terms of invasive non-native species, we focus particularly on freshwater and bankside or riparian non-native plant species. So we're going to be talking about invasive non-native species or INS for the rest of the talk. I will refer to them as INS. An INS is defined as any animal or plant which is introduced to places where it does not occur naturally through human actions or deliberate 
deliberate or accidental. And this is crucial, where it causes negative impacts. So in the UK, there are approximately 3,000 non-native species, and most of these don't have a negative impact on the environment. It is those species that have the capability of becoming invasive that we need to worry about, either because they are bigger or more vigorous than native species, or simply because they don't have any natural predators to check them back. After habitat destruction and climate change, INS are often cited as the single greatest threat to native biodiversity at a national level. Where INS manage to become established, they affect native wildlife and habitats in a variety of different ways. By predation, so the photo at the top is an American mink, and this species has had a significant impact um, on ground nesting birds and other other species. Uh, my competition, so the other photo at the top is floating pennywort, um, and where it has outcompeted native species and taken over, it can lead to a lack of oxygen in that water body. Um, through disease, so the photo at the bottom left is an American signal crayfish, and these guys carry crayfish plague which is deadly to our UK native crayfish, um, which has had a negative impact on their populations. And the last photo is of a ruddy duck. And these guys have posed a major threat to the Spanish population of endangered white-headed ducks by hybridisation and out-competing them. They also affect the way that we live. So INS uh, affect humans in various ways, they can affect our health. So the top photo at the left is giant hogweed, um, uh, someone who's come into contact with giant hogweed. The plants contain chemical chemicals in the sap, and if they come into contact with human skin, mixed with UV light, they can cause, they can cause severe burns and blistering. They have uh, economic impact. So a report in 2018 found that Japanese knotweed uh, knocked £20 billion pounds off the total value of UK property, with mortgage lenders refusing loans for properties affected by the plant. And finally, it can, they can affect our lifestyle by invading homes, changing our travel habits and affecting food security for the future. So they're estimated to cost the economy £1.7 billion annually. So in recognition of these damaging effects, that INS are having, um, they are regulated by law. So in the UK, the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 is the principal legislation relating to the control of INS. So under this legislation, it is the law that a landowner must ensure that any INS growing on their land uh, doesn't spread into the wild, including natural spread. Um, it defines the wild by excluding arable and horticultural land settlements and private gardens. Uh, there's a more recent piece of European legislation which came into force in 2015 and poses restrictions on a list of species, some of which we have in the northeast. Uh, the photo at the bottom is of me holding an American skunk cabbage. So this species can outcompete native species due to its size and is difficult to get rid of once established. Um, luckily, this piece of legislation covers this species. So if you want to find out more information, I recommend the GB Non-Native Species Secretariat website. Um, so these guys have the responsibility for helping to coordinate the approach to invasive non-native species in Great Britain. They're responsible to a program board, which represents the relevant government bodies and agencies of England, Scotland and Wales. The website helps those who are interested in finding out more about INS and to facilitate those working on the subject. If you are particularly interested in a certain species you have spotted or something in the field and you want clarification, go to the species information portal here and you can find out, for example, about giant hogweed 
um, and it pulls up an information sheet which you can have a look at. Um, the site can also be used to keep up to date with projects, news and events and find out what's happening to help tackle these problem species. Um, and you can also learn about biosecurity and prevention. Uh, also on the website where you can explain all about how to get involved and reduce the risk of spreading inns into the wild. The Check Clean Dry campaign is the leading campaign which we should all be following. It is easy, essentially, uh, wherever you're out in the field, if you're working or if you're um, doing your hobbies or whatever, you must check your equipment and your clothing, clean your footwear and equipment and dry it after use. And these are really simple me methods that you can use to help stop the spread of these problem species um, and before you go somewhere new. So there's specific guidance available for different river or water users. So please check it out and follow the link below. Um, there's also the Bee the Plantwise campaign, which is for horticulturalists. Um, you can also download a pocket ID guide to identify freshwater inns in your area. So these photos here are all examples of where inns have ended up in the tweed catchment because biosecurity measures were not adhered to. In the top, the photo is of a site where giant hogweed was found after a workforce had cleared trees and power lines. So it's likely that these seeds were moved here via soil that were contained seeds and stuck in the tire treads. The top right photo is of an aquatic species called Crastula, which we found in a pond where it had been dumped there. Um, the bottom left photo is of a wet wood in the north of the catchment, uh, which we found infested with American skunk cabbage, where it had escaped from a nearby garden. And the last photo is of a walking boot covered in a species called Piri Piri Burr. So this species is a huge problem um, on Linders Farm National Nature Reserve and on the sand dunes there. Um, we are increasingly seeing it pop up along footpaths next to the tweed. So we kind of know where it's come from, people's walking boots um, and potentially hair from dogs. So when we find these species, we have a biosecurity plan and a framework in place to deal with the inns, these inns entering the catchment, which goes along the lines of surveillance, early detection and rapid response. Essentially, we need lots of eyes on the ground to spot these problem species before they get established. And if they do, rapidly respond to them with an appropriate control mechanism before they become out of hand. So, when inns do become established in a catchment, the only way to reverse the problem is to invest in a long-term solution. The Tweed Invasives project has been in existence now since 2003. Um, we tackle four main species, which is giant hogweed, Himalayan balsam, Japanese knotweed and American skunk cabbage. We target these species across the entire 5,000 square kilometre catchment. Um, so this project is one of the largest and longest running control programmes in the UK. So it started in 2003 and the red areas on the map are where giant hogweed was recorded as high density, which was a lot of the catchment. Um, the photo on the right, right shows what many of the banks look like. So there was a great deal of concern about this because, as we know, it uh, contains toxic sap. Um, and nobody seemed to have a clear ownership of the issue. There was some control going on on both sides of the borders, but it wasn't really making a difference. So Tweed Forum stepped in as the lead organisation to tackle the problem. So recognising the sheer scale of what we were taking on and knowing we were signing up for a very long term project, it was obvious we needed a significant amount of money to kick things off. 
Um, we included the INS project as a component of a wider heritage lottery project. Um, and we were lucky enough to get the funding to kick things off. Since 2003, we have been going out every year, controlling our target INS across a thousand kilometres of watercourse. Um, we record everything we find um, and control. And we try and involve as many volunteers as possible to help with the control effort and to help survey watercourses for inns. We roughly have 30 to 40 volunteers uh, each year who actively control inns, um, which is a great help. And to maintain this momentum and to ensure progress is not lost, we have to fundraise and promote the project. Um, if you are out walking in the tweed catchment and you spot a giant hogweed, then please report your sighting directly to us so that we can rapidly respond and deal with it. And the uh, uh, email address is at the bottom of this page. So as a result of our hard work and dedication, we have reversed the negative impacts of inns by virtually removing them from the catchment. So we're now at a point where seeing a giant hogweed along the main river is not common. And here's some photos from 2003 and to the present day, just to illustrate the difference. A massive consideration to any new INS project is always going to be the cost. So in order to succeed, um, the control program must be long term. So over the course of the project, we've spent in the region of 1.6 million trying to eradicate inns from the Tweed catchment. Um, as you can see from the graph, our main expense is contract labour. The amount of as the amount of inns decreases, the area still needs surveying. So the cost um, sort of plateaus slightly, although it is quicker. Um, recently, we have invested in a different type of control for one of our most widespread inns, which um, I will quickly cover in the next slide. So this is Himalayan balsam. Uh, the abundance of Himalayan balsam across the catchment is so high that it's not feasible to do catchment wide control using traditional methods. Um, such you know such as pulling or spraying that type of thing so we are working with an organization called cabby um, on a trial release of a rust pathogen which is found in its native range um, the pathogen has been licensed by defra for release um, but essentially the idea is to establish a self-sustaining population so that over time the rust uh, can infect um, and be at a sufficiently high level to spread to other balsam plants. So as the rust grows, it draws nutrients away from the plant, which decreases the vigour. By limiting its growth and reducing its ability to produce seed, giving native plants a bit more of a chance, um, and the hope is that they will coexist instead of being swamped out. You can find out more about this project on our website um, by following the link below. Thank you very much, Emily. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe Tailforth, and I'm project officer here at Tweed Forum. And last year, I helped coordinate the Northeast Invasive Non-Native Species Strategy and Action Plan, which was funded and in partnership with the Environment Agency and run from September 2019 to March this year. As Emily mentioned, the focus is on freshwater and riparian species, but other species are included too. And if you'd like to find out more information, I recommend you follow the link at the bottom of this slide. So we're here in the northeast, where the project area covers, covers Berwick upon Tweed in the north, down to Middlesbrough at the southern end, and incorporates the river catchments of the Tees, the Weir, Tyne, the Northumberland rivers and the Till, which is part of the wider Tweed catchment. As mentioned earlier, the problem is that it is possible, but very difficult to eradicate inns once established. So we must seek to cost effectively control where possible and focus on prevention to stop the spread. 
There is also an issue with the, with the lack of awareness, where often people are not aware of the impact of inns or know how to identify the main species. And there's a lack of joined up working where pro projects exist to manage inns, but often these are specific to a river, wildlife reserve or catchment, which increase the risk of reinfestation. Finally, there is difficulty in securing long term control. This is because it is expensive and takes many years of hard work to make an impact. By working more strategically, we can hope to make control more efficient. To try and find solutions to these issues, we established a working group with key stakeholders in the region. These were the Environment Agency, Natural England, Northumbrian Water Limited, the Tees, the Tyne, the Weir and Northumberland Rivers Trust, and also ERIC. And we came up with four main objectives. And these are increased regional coordination of INS management, reduce the risk of the introduction and spread of freshwater and riparian INS in the Northeast through increased awareness and biosecurity, detection and surveillance, to ensure appropriate rapid management responses, strategic and sustainable implementation of long-term local control and eradication programs. So in short, we now seek to work together more, prevent infestation, respond to new reports quickly, and plan long-term control strategically. And we don't have time to go into all the detail of the strategy, but I'll pick out some of the main themes and go through them here. So across the northeast, we have lots of organisations all working on INS, and you can see them all on this slide here. And we also have lots of projects, and unfortunately, we have lots of INS as well. So to meet the first objective, we need to start working together more. And the wheels are already in the motion with submission of a regional funding bid, and there are also plans for a regional biosecurity action group, uh, which will get everyone around the table talking about this issue. So one of the first steps we took was to look at the species and decide what can be done by following best practice. To do this, we used existing recognised methodology and looked at each inns in and around the northeast and placed them into one of four categories. So these are the blacklist inns, which are alert species that are not currently present in the region, but assessed as a high risk and threat. The red list inns, which are high, pit, high impact species that are present in a small number of sites but not well established or abundant. The amber list inns, which are well established species whose eradication is difficult or not feasible but control is important due to their impact. And finally the green list inns, which are species present or established in the region whose eradication is currently not feasible and management is not a priority because of low impact or poor cost effectiveness. So using these categories, we can start to think about options for future management. So with the blacklist species, ins and, uh, where INS are not currently present, um, prevention is key here, um, followed by containment or eradication. Each individual species has a management recommendation within the strategy, and you can have a look at this in the main document. The red list species are not widespread, but have potential to cause a high impact, and so must be eradicated or contained as a priority. And here we have a map of the red list species in the northeast using ERIC data. The red list species shown on the map and in the images are American skunk cabbage, common core grass, floating pennywort, parrot's feather, sea buckthorn, three-cornered garlic and zebra mussel. As you can see, most of the occurrences are around the coastline. The amber list species are well established and where eradication is difficult, but we must control and slow the spread due to their impact. If an amber list species is successfully controlled, it will be reclassified into the red category. And we have the amber list ins map here, um, also using ERIC data as well. If we look at the amber list map, we can see that they are, they are by definition well established, so there's lots of them. These are the species that are the focus of most INS efforts in the northeast, 
and include control of giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam by the Rivers Trust. Also includes mink that are the focus of the Naturally Native Wildlife Trust partnership that seeks to conserve the native water vol and also efforts by coastal partnerships to manage Piri Piri Burr. Finally, we have the green category where species are established but eradication is not currently feasible because of low impact or cost effectiveness. In these cases, we focus on priority areas such as nature reserves, which we'll talk about shortly. So here we have the distribution of greenlist inns. It must be said that it's likely that there is a recording bias here, meaning that their distributions are, are um, underestimated. Um, for instance, the record of rhododendron is not likely to be complete, um, and you can see it there in light green. Now that we have management plans for each species category, we can start to think about where to target action. And we can do this by looking at how species are being introduced and spread, i.e. by looking at their pathways. Here we have a graph showing pathways per black, red, amber and green list ins. Black and red list ins show a similar pattern as they are predominantly aquatic and invertebrates. Important pathways for the majority of amber and green species are horticulture, garden escapes, garden waste, machinery, debris and waste. By looking, at, by looking at the pathways, we can start to target groups like garden centres, ports, construction organisations and recreational users like fishermen, canoeists and dog walkers. We can also target based on habitat or conservation importance. Here we have light green areas showing sites of special scientific interest, also known as triple SIs, um, and where the dark green areas show those that have a known INS issue. And we can start to prioritise action in these areas, as well as by looking at local designations too. So these areas might be appropriate for the control of greenless species, such as rhododendron, um, as well as the amber and red leaf species as well, of course. We can also preferentially target small populations of inns that have a high chance of being spread, i.e. at the top of watercourses or on railway lines. Or if we look at the map here, by looking at species distributions of native and non-native species, here we have the vulnerable native white-clawed crayfish distribution in green and the invasive signal crayfish, which carries the crayfish plague in orange. Native populations exist on the Wandsbeck in Northumberland, while signal crayfish are present in the nearby rivers, the Pont and the Blythe. So this will be a priority for action or for prevention. Finally, I will talk about rapid response, which is the process of identifying and recording an INS and responding to the report quickly to prevent further spread. This is most important for blacklist species and new occurrence is of redlist species. Currently, there is no such system in place regionally, although local versions with individual organisations do exist, such as our own rapid response in the Tweed catchment. Um, but we've been working with Eric to think about how such a system um, could work. And in the diagram, a new INS is recorded via an individual, an app or an organisation and sent to the central database, which in this example could be Eric. The record is then verified and an appropriate alert sent out. Some species are GB priority and have a management response already, while others will need to be addressed by local organisations. If we can get such a system in place, then new reports of high impact INS can be dealt with quickly to prevent further spread. This helps protect the environment while also saving time and money on costly control in the future. One of the key components of this is having eyes on the ground and reliable reported sighting. Which brings on to the final slide, how to get involved. As mentioned, the best way to get involved is to learn the main species and report your sightings. This can be done via the ERIC portal, via an existing group, or using a citizen science app such as iRecord. You can also spread the word about the importance of INS and follow the Check Clean Dry Guidance on the Native Species Secretariat website. And finally, if you can look for volunteering and you can look for volunteering opportunities with your local Rivers Trust or Wildlife Trust. 
and I'll leave you here with some useful links and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.